Coming on the air with breaking news, and it is another shooting incident, this time in Colorado at a STEM school in the suburb of Highlands Ranch at south of Denver. With the suspects in custody, the race to get those eight injured kids to the hospitals began. We have learned within the last 15 minutes that one of those students has died. Hey guys, this is obviously a bit of a different intro than you're used to, and it's a lot more of a, a solemn attitude that we have this morning. It's the morning after we had the STEM school shooting in Highlands Ranch. Uh, that occurred on the afternoon of May 7th. And it was a big response from our fire department um, through all the ranks from our dispatch center to our, our paramedics, firefighters, chief officers. And uh, the vlog today is dedicated really just to talk about that incident and what happened since it's making international headlines and a lot of people are curious about how things went down. Um, for the incident, I was uh, responding to the scene, got on scene pretty early on, and then tied in with one of our district chiefs. And Connor was on the other side of the district when the incident occurred and ended up going to our dispatch center to help out there. And really, the calls for help start in dispatch. So they initiated with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office when people first reported the incident. And as soon as the Sheriff's Office understood that people were hurt and were on the phone with people who were with those individuals who were injured, those calls got transferred to our 911 dispatch center where they started doing patient care over the phone and getting resources to respond. Um, so Connor can tell us about what happened when she was in dispatch and, and mm -hmm. what those 911 dispatchers went through. Absolutely. And uh, when you think about those emergency calls that come into dispatch, those are going right into the ears and into the hearts and minds of those dispatchers. So obviously, um, they were dealing with a lot. When I walked down into METCOM, which is kind of in the basement of our headquarters, uh, so many people were down there. We had chiefs, we had supervisors, dispatchers, and they were all working together as a team to make sure that they were getting the most updated information to the people who needed to know it and also getting our crews to the scene or also to the staging area. So uh, they were juggling a lot and um, some of them were looking at maps, some of them were looking at um, where everyone was located. They were talking to different people on scene. So uh, just being down there and knowing that Eric was also over on scene dealing with um, the immediacy of that, but then the most important, um, one of the most important parts of it is the communication aspect. So uh, we were able to uh, listen to some of the calls that came in to our dispatchers. And if you can imagine hearing on the other end of a phone line someone who has been injured in a shooting someone who is helping someone try to stop that bleeding it's really emotional and uh, I got to I have to say that our dispatchers do an amazing job at walking them through what to do how to handle the situation how to keep them calm while also staying calm themselves so uh, an absolute teamwork effort down in Metcom to make sure the communication was sm was flowing smoothly from the response side of things with operations with uh, chief officers, safety officers, engines, medic units responding to the scene, this is a situation that as you've seen if you followed us on YouTube, we've been training for a lot over the past several years. In fact, you can see videos about two of the really major multi-agency drills that we've done and then a smaller scale one that we did just a couple weeks ago. Uh, oddly enough, about a quarter of a mile from where the shooting happened is, is where we did the drill at the hospital just a couple weeks ago. So it's something that we have very, very thorough policies and procedures and, and we're prepared for. It's something that we hoped would never have to happen in our fire district again. A lot of people are interested in the initial response and it escalated very quickly. So it started uh, with some chief officers, engines and medics responding. And then as we got more information that there was a potential for multiple victims, the incident got upgraded to what our fire department defines as a large MCI. And the large MCI response includes one rescue company, a heavy rescue unit, uh, includes three ladder trucks, 12 engines, 12 transport units. So those could be fire department medic units or private ambulances, the district chief, five battalion chiefs, two safety officers, and a mobile command post. 
South Metro had obviously a very large response to this incident, and when we tabulate the units, it's well over 150 support personnel, ambulances, and, and fire apparatus that responded. So we rely heavily on our neighbors, our mutual aid and auto aid partners, and we certainly couldn't do it without them. There are literally dozens of agencies, so it's hard for us to list them here, but they know who they are, and, and we're really grateful for their response. Uh, we have those policies and, and those agreements in place so that we can help each other in times of need. Oftentimes, South Metro is responding outside of our district boundaries to help other people, and this is one of those times where we had to call upon them to help us. And it, it's beyond helping South Metro. It's really the goal is we've got to help the people who need it most, and, and that's the people who are injured. And to them, it doesn't matter what the fire truck or the ambulance says on it, they just need help. And so we take that same stance and we will send the closest, most appropriate help available. And that's exactly what we did. Aside from that first wave of initial responders, we also had a staging area set up where additional resources are kept in case they're needed on scene. And the PAR level there, so the amount of resources that always had to be in staging or on their way to staging, was five suppression units, which, which means five fire engines of some type, whether they're aerials or engines doesn't matter, but just for the personnel, five of those and 10 transport units. And that was the minimum level that we were keeping in staging at all times as crews would go into the scene, take a patient and transport them to the hospital. We also had three air medical helicopters respond to the scene and there was a landing zone very close to where the incident occurred. The idea behind those helicopters isn't for an immediate transport because we have so many hospitals close to us, but it's to transport patients to further away facilities that would be a far drive by ambulance to try and balance the load of injured people across the different hospitals. The worst thing that we can do is take all of the injured people to the closest hospital and then overwhelm that hospital. So we try and have a little diversity in which hospitals patients go to and we track all of that. One of the really important jobs that METCOM does ahead of time is they use a system um, that's virtual. It's, a, it's an internet tracking system where they ping the hospitals, let them know that there's a mass casualty incident and request a bed count. So the dispatchers will add up how many uh, red, yellow, and green patients based off of their severity level that each hospital can take. That information is relayed to the scene so that the responders on scene can make good decisions on where they're transporting patients to. In the photos and in the videos that you'll see from the scene, South Metro's personnel are wearing ballistic vests and ballistic helmets. And the reason for that is because we don't delay getting to patients or getting close to where the patients are until we get a 100% scene safe from law enforcement because that can take too long and that jeopardizes the patients who need our help. So the firefighters are equipped to enter into those warm and hot zones. They marry up with law enforcement officers who are armed and together law enforcement fire and paramedics go in and extract patients out to waiting ambulances and transport them to the hospital so even though south metro's personnel are equipped with ballistic equipment to keep them safe they're not armed so our firefighters and our paramedics are not carrying guns with them into the scene that's where we rely very heavily on our law enforcement partners to protect the firefighters and paramedics as they're going about the duties on scene and doing what they need to do. So after the incident occurs, there's a lot of different steps that our department takes going forward to make sure that our people are okay, as well as things we can learn from in this incident. One piece of that is through our peer support program, we have an emergency responder service dog program. And Champ, one of our dogs, actually went around to some of the dispatchers in METCOM yesterday after they had taken those calls for service to make sure that they were doing okay. And it's, it's a moment for them to just kind of step away from what they've been through and um, have some have some love and support there for them. And there's a lot of resources that are available to any of us here at South Metro from peer support to our employee assistance program where we can go see mental health professionals at any time and there's a list of those resources available. And of course, if somebody um, has an emergency need for their mental well-being, um, we have ways for them to get help immediately. So uh, we understand that in public safety, the suicide rate among first responders or emergency responders is higher than the rate at which they're dying in the line of duty. And so it's a priority for all of us to make sure that we're okay. We do a really good job checking in on each other and there's a ton of resources available, but it's a difficult recovery for everybody who responds. There's, there's nothing superhuman about 
everyone who made this call go the way it did and, and go well and have a good response. They're feeling the, the same kind of effects that our community members are feeling and we're, we're mourning with our community and um, we're saddened, we're, we're angered, we're all of those things that our community members feel. And uh, thankfully our department does a really good job to make sure that we're all taken care of. In ending this vlog this week, we want to take a moment to thank all of our community members on social media um, for the support that you have shown for uh, the agencies that were involved as well as the people affected by this, this incident. I uh, also want to just take the moment to thank our law enforcement agency partners, uh, the people that are working in the hospitals, our staff here at the department for working together in such an important time. Yeah, this is, this is a team effort, a community effort. We couldn't do it without our agency partners, and we certainly couldn't do it without the support of our community members, and it means a lot. And just know that all of us here at the department are feeling the same way that you are right now, and, and there's not a lot that we can say. It's, it's just uh, like the picture of our, uh, our dispatch supervisor that Connor took yesterday. The, the look just kind of says it all. So uh, we'll end with that and hope for a, a happier vlog next week.